Common types of fracture. A green stick fracture is on one side of the bone causing a bend on the other side of the bone. Transverse fracture is that the fracture is at right angles to the long axis of the bone. Closed or simple fracture, the bone is broken but the skin is not lacerated. Oblique fracture, the fracture is diagonal to a bone's long axis. Comminated fracture, it results in three or more bone fragments. Spiral fracture, at least one part of the bone has been twisted. Open or compound fracture, the skin may be pierced by the bone or by a blow that breaks the skin at the time of the fracture. The bone may or may not be visible in the wound. Care for these patients is at vital signs, level of consciousness, oxygen saturation, neurovascular status, and pain. It's always a good idea to put where you feel the pulse. If the nurse after you cannot feel it, they can use it as a guide to check with the Doppler before calling a physician. With fractures, monitor for fat embolism, especially if it is a long bone fracture. The normal PT level is 9.5 to 12 seconds. If the results are twice the normal level, that is increasing the patient's risk for bleeding during and following a surgery. Inflammation starts immediately after the bone is fractured and lasts for several days. When the bone is fractured, there is bleeding into the area leading to inflammation and clotting of blood at the fracture site. This provides the initial structural stability and framework for producing new bone. Bone production begins when the clotted blood formed by inflammation is replaced with fibrous tissue and cartilage known as soft callus. As healing progresses, the soft callus is replaced with hard bone known as the hard callus, which is visible on x-ray several weeks after the fracture. Bone remodeling is the final phase of bone healing and goes on for several months. In remodeling, bone continues to form and become compact, returning to its original shape. In addition, blood circulation in the area improves. Once adequate bone healing has occurred, weight bearing, such as standing or walking, encourages bone remodeling. Bone generally takes six to eight weeks to heal to a significant degree. Smoking cessation and adequate control of blood sugar levels in diabetics are important. Smoking and high glucose levels interfere with bone healing. For all patients with fractured bones, immobilization is a critical part of treatment because any movement of bone fragments slows down the initial healing process. Once the bone is adequately healed, physical therapy often plays a key role in rehabilitation. An exercise program designed for your patient can help in regaining strength and balance and assist in returning to normal activities. Postoperative management is to minimize pain and discomfort through proper alignment and positioning, frequent neurovascular assessments of the affected extremity, expected activity limitations after surgery and assure them that their needs will be met and that includes pain medication. Once the bone has healed, the rods or pins that were placed may need to be surgically removed. A broken femur is a serious injury that takes about three to six months to heal. Discharge instructions would be to arrange household items to be within reach, remove electrical cords, throw rugs, and anything else that may cause them to fall. Use non-slip bath mats, grab bars, an elevated toilet seat, and a shower chair in the bathroom. Follow the weight-bearing instructions and how much or not is the patient allowed to put on the leg. Use a cane, crutches, a walker, or handrails until their balance, flexibility, and strength improve. For a patient to have their hands free to, so they can keep their balance, they can use a fanny pack, apron, or pockets to carry things. They are not to drive until cleared and they need to reposition themselves at least every 60 minutes. Never drive while taking a narcotic pain medication. And if they wear a leg brace or immobilizer, cover with plastic to keep dry while they shower. If they do not wear a leg brace or immobilizer, carefully wash the incision with soap and water. Gently pat it dry. Don't rub the incision or apply creams or lotions to it. To avoid falling after showering, they need to sit on a shower stool. They need to tell all of their health care providers, including their dentist, that they have a rod or pin in their leg. They will likely need to take antibiotics before dental work and other medical procedures to reduce the risk of infection. A cast is a rigid dressing used to immobilize fractured bone or soft tissue. It's made of strips of impregnated with plaster or fiberglass material. The injured area is first covered with a layer of padding made of cotton or synthetic materials to protect the skin from irritation. The plaster or fiberglass strips 
are then dipped in water and applied over the padding to form the cast. Wet casts must be handled carefully using only the palms of the hand because a wet cast can be dented or compressed if handled too much after application. Dents or compression of the cast can cause pressure or irritation to the skin beneath the dressing which may develop sores or ulcers. Patients in a hip cast or body cast should be repositioned every two hours during the first 24 hours to allow even drying of the cast and every two hours when awake thereafter to avoid developing pressure sores on the skin. Aftercare includes measuring the patient for crutches or a sling as appropriate. Patients should be given aftercare instructions to keep the cast dry. Water weakens plaster casts and may cause skin irritation beneath the cast. The patient should use two layers of plastic to keep the cast dry while showering. To decrease swelling and pain in the first 24 to 48 hours, the patient should place crushed ice in a plastic bag covered with a pillowcase or towel on the cast over the injury every 15 minutes per hour while awake. The physician will remove the cast at an appropriate time with the saw that cuts through the casting material but does not damage the skin. If a bivalve cast is used, it allows for removal of the top half for wound care or x-ray films or for ease in assessing tissue perfusion or pressure areas. When the top half is reapplied, the nurse must take precautions not to pinch the patient's extremity between the two halves as they are secured together with a nace wrap. These are actions that will reduce edema and enhance drying of the cast, prevent complications, and manage complications of compartment syndrome. Body casts, which cover the trunk of the body and in some cases the neck up to or including the head or one or more limbs are rarely used today and are most commonly used in the cases of small children who cannot be trusted to comply with the brace or in cases of radical surgery to repair an injury or other defect. A body cast, which encases the trunk with straps over the shoulder, is usually referred to as a body jacket. Nursing assessment should include observation of respiratory status bowel and bladder function, areas of pressure over bony prominences, and the nurse should reposition the patient every two hours during the time the cast is drying. Cast syndrome is an initial symptom of feeling of fullness followed by nausea and vomiting. Abdominal distension is obscured in the presence of a body jacket. Vomiting, which may be intermittent in the early stages, becomes pernicious with dehydration and metabolic alkalosis. This could progress to oliguria and shock. Patients at risk should be turned frequently or encouraged to move themselves from side to side. The treatment is absolute dietary restriction should be imposed supplemented by nasogastric suction. Intravenous fluids are essential to main hydration and to correct any electrolyte or acid base abnormalities. If these conservative measures are not sufficient to reverse the process, the treatment of choice is surgery for a duodenogenostomy or gastrogenostomy. Traction is an orthopedic treatment that involves placing tension on a limb, bone, or muscle group using various weight and pulley systems. Traction is applied to decrease muscle spasms, reduce, align, and immobilize fractures, the femur fractures that cannot be immobilized in the cast, correct or prevent deformity, increase space between joint surfaces, monitor skin integrity of the affected part before and after traction placement, assess the skin, especially bony prominences, for breakdown and assess neurovascular status. Monitor the respiratory status including rate and pattern, breath and lung sounds, the ability to cough and deep breathe deeply. Evaluate muscle strength and tone and mobility in affected and unaffected areas. Assess mental status, noting their level of orientation, effectiveness of coping, and behavior. Regularly check the condition of the traction equipment, the ropes, pulleys, and weights. Eliminate any factors that reduce the traction pull or alter its directions. Ropes and pulleys should be in straight alignment and the rope should be unobstructed. Traction is not accomplished if the knot in the rope is touching the pulley or the foot of the bed. The weights must be suspended and not in contact with the bed or resting on the floor. The patient's body should always be in alignment with the force of traction. Check the patient's position each time you enter the room and help the patient slide up in bed if necessary. Encourage them to use the overhead trapeze instead of their elbows to move in bed. Check the extremities for color, pallor, cyanosis, numbness, edema, signs of infection, and pain. Look for areas of skin breakdown or pressure sores on all skin surfaces. For the patient in skeletal traction, 
Assess the pin site for signs and symptoms of infection. Skin traction requires pressure on the skin to maintain the pulling force across the bone. Skin traction, like Buck's traction or pelvic traction, involves the weight applied and held to the skin with a Velcro splint. A maximum of 10 pound weight may be applied using this method. More than that could result in the skin becoming excoriated with blister formation and pressure sores caused by the slipping of the tightly wrapped strapping. Wrapping the straps more tightly to prevent slipping increases the risk of creating a compartment syndrome in the injured extremity. If more than 10 pounds of weight is needed to control the fracture, then a skeletal traction is needed. Skeletal traction involves the weight applied and attached to metal inserted into the bone, like pins, wires, or tongs. It is important to place the pin correctly to avoid injury to vessels, nerves, joints, and growth plate. There are more risks associated with skeletal traction. Bone inflammation may occur in response to the introduction of foreign material into the body. Infection can occur at the pin sites, and if caught early, infection can be treated with antibiotics, but if it is severe, it may require removal of the pin. The circulation assessment. Pain. Determine where the pain is located and if it's worse or better. Worsening pain may indicate increased edema, lack of adequate blood supply, or tissue damage. Check the pulse. Checking the peripheral pulses, especially those distal to the fracture site. Compare all pulses with those on the unaffected side, and pulses should be strong and equal. Pallor. Observe the color and temperature of the skin, especially around the fracture site. Perform the capillary refill test. Paresthesia. Examine the injured area for increase or decrease in sensation. Can the patient detect tactile stimulation such as a blunt touch or a sharp pinprick? Does the patient complain of numbness or tingling? And then paralysis. Check the patient's mobility. Can they wiggle their toes and fingers? Can they move their extremities? If a patient has a fall in blood pressure and diaphoresis, it may indicate a possible vasovagal response to increased activity with vasodilation rather than vasoconstriction. A normal response to increased activity includes increased blood pressure, heart rate, respirations, facial flushing, and fatigue due to the increased demand for oxygen during exercise. That would be a normal response. Abnormal would be if their blood pressure fell and they got diaphoretic. Persistent skin pressures may impair blood flow and cause injury to peripheral neurovascular structures. Observe skeletal traction pins for infection. Pin care varies, but usually includes regular removal of exudate, rinsing pin sites, and drying the area. External rotation of the hip can occur when skin traction is used on lower extremities, and the nurse can correct this position by placing a pillow, sandbag, or rolled up draw sheet along the greater trochantic region of the femur. Patients should be in the center of the bed in a supine position. Incorrect alignment can result in increased pain and non-union or malunion. Skeletal traction pins or screws are surgically inserted into the bone in order to aid in the bone alignment. The top part of this picture shows a pin that is infected. Non-weight bearing means no weight can be placed on the operated leg. This is the most restrictive of all weight bearing limitations. Toe touch weight bearing means that only the toes on the operated leg are able to contact the ground. This is for balance only. Partial weight bearing allows to place half of the weight on the operated extremity. Full weight bearing allows them to place all of the weight on the operated extremity. A three-point crutch walking gait is used when a limb cannot bear weight. The affected leg and crutch are advanced together and the strong leg swings through. This requires considerable arm strength. A two and four point crutch walking gait requires weight bearing on both feet. Although infection and the severity of the bone trauma are important deterrents to normal fracture healing, instability is the most common cause for a non-union. A non-union occurs when a bone does not heal within six to nine months after a break or fracture. A delayed union is when a fracture takes longer than usual to heal. There are several reasons why bone fractures or bone trauma may not heal, including blood supply. Blood brings the components for healing to the fracture site. These include oxygen, healing cells, and the body's own chemicals necessarily for healing. The blood supply to the injured bone usually comes back on its own during the healing period. 
use of tobacco or nicotine in any form, such as smoking, chewing tobacco, and the use of nicotine gum or patches, significantly inhibit bone healing and increase the chance of a non-union. A simple evaluation of a patient's gait can be performed in a straight hallway without pictures or other objects that may distract the eye. The nurse should use a gait belt or similar device to help support the patient in case they lose their balance. To fit a patient for a cane, they should wear their normal walking shoes, stand up straight with their arms hanging loosely at their side, measure the distance from the floor to the crease of the wrists. This measurement is normally the best height for the cane. A cane is normally held on the side opposite the affected extremity. A quad cane is hard to use on stairs and may be unstable on some surfaces, especially since the patient must have all four cane legs down on the floor or pavement with hand pressure centered over the legs. In stair gait training, the patient is taught a basic rule regarding the affected and unaffected sides of their body. Go up with the good leg and down with the bad. A transfer belt provides a secure handle for holding on to the patient. The nurse should assume a broad stance, not keep the feet close together because it would narrow the nurse's base of support. Instructing a patient to encircle a nurse's waist would cause the nurse to be off balance. Activities that cause hips to bend greater than 90 degrees, twisting or crossing the legs, and internal or external hip rotation should be avoided because that could cause dislocation of a prosthetic hip. The legs should be abducted to prevent hip prosthesis dislocation. Caution for a total hip should continue for three to four months. Correct care of an amputated body part will greatly prolong the window of salvageability of the limb. The more soft tissue present in the amputated part, the entire arm versus a single finger, the less tolerant it will be to ischemia. This tolerance can increase from four to six hours to around 18 hours by cooling. Carefully remove any clothing, dirt, and debris from the body part. It may be gently irrigated with saline to assist in this process. It should then be wrapped in sterile combines that have been soaked in saline. It should be placed in a watertight plastic bag that is then immersed in a container holding an ice water slurry, which is a mix of ice cubes and water. The amputated part should not be in direct contact with water or ice. Once it has been properly packaged, make sure it is clearly identified as belonging to the patient. The body part should always remain in close proximity to the patient. This is even more important if you have multiple casualties. However, if it's a finger or smaller item, don't leave it sitting in clear view of a patient. I imagine that this would be a little disconcerting. Remember that if a body part contains bones, the doctors will still probably want to have it x-rayed. Stump care. Range of motion to prevent flexion contractures, particularly of the hip and knee, are needed. Using weights will increase muscle power and strength in the shoulder, arm, forearm, wrist, finger, and thumb muscles and will prepare the muscles for the work of crutch walking. Isometric exercises are used to maintain strength and increase muscle tone. Frequent prosthetic adjustments are often required in the first year. When the prosthesis does not feel comfortable during standing and walking, it should be removed and reapplied. A figure eight should be used to help shape the residual limb and reduce edema. An elastic residual limb shrinker is used to condition and shape the residual limb. Initially, pushing the residual limb into a soft pillow and then into a firmer pillow and finally onto a hard surface toughens the residual limb in preparation for a prosthesis. A tourniquet is needed at the patient's bedside to apply to the residual limb if hemorrhaging occurs immediately postoperatively. Postoperative residual limb edema is common following amputation. It is uncomfortable for the patient and it may impede wound healing by increasing tissue and venous pressures. Rigid dressings help reduce this problem. If soft dressings are used, they should be combined with compression stump wrapping. Compression stump wrappings, if too tight proximally, can produce a bulbous distal swelling and residual limb that is difficult to encase within a prosthetic socket. The stump must be washed daily to avoid irritations and infection. Mild soap and warm water are recommended. The interior of plastic sockets also must be kept clean by washing daily with warm water and a mild soap. Use of detergent should be avoided at all times. Some amputees have found a hair dryer to be useful in drying the stump and preparing the socket to be applied. Prosthetic socks must be carefully applied to avoid wrinkles and should be replaced daily with new laundered ones 
and more often in warm, humid weather. They should be washed in warm water with mild soap. Manufacturers recommend that socks be rotated on at least a three or four day schedule to allow the fibers to return to their original position. Phantom limb pain is a frequent complication of amputation. Patients complain of pain at the site of the removed body part most often shortly after surgery. The pain is intense burning feeling, crushing sensation or cramping. Some patients feel that the removed body part is in a distorted position and phantom limb pain must be distinguished from stump pain because they are managed differently. Recognize that this pain is real and interferes with the amputee's activities of daily living. Opioids are not as effective for phantom limb pain as they are for residual limb pain. Other drugs would include beta blockers, antileptic met drugs, antispasmodic, and IV infusion of calcitonin have been known to help manage phantom limb pain. In this picture is mirror therapy. The patient uses mirror therapy to trick his brain as if he is moving the amputated body part. This has been shown to decrease pain of phantom limb.